minority for sure. One of the things that I think is really powerful about paranormal, or at least has the potential to be powerful, is that it's used as a metaphor um, for sort of the things, paranormal and dystopia really, are ways of getting at um, topics that we aren't necessarily comfortable addressing head on right now. So romance, sex, um, is our government sinister? Uh, we maybe can't talk about that rooted in our universe, but I think that paranormal is giving readers a way of thinking about it. No, I think they pretty much covered. I I wanted to jump a little bit onto Stacy, your comment that it's growing and evolving. Twilight and the Suki Stackhouse mysteries. I mean, not quite the same time period, but we see that dominant genre in adult, and then it sort of seems to trickle down into YA. So does it get popular in one and then jump to the other? Does it tend to, to go down from adult to YA, or does it tend to mutually influence? Well, I think <clears throat> we forget sometimes that kids read up, you know, so it's not like that, you know, the YA audience is only reading YA, they're also reading adult books and, you know, kids know what they like pretty early on. I, you know, certainly I have nieces and nephews who I can identify them. They are, they are the romance readers, and you know, that's what they're going to continue reading and enjoying throughout their lives. And they read adult works just as well as they read YA works. So I don't necessarily think it's a kind of a trickling down, but I think it's recognizing that readers are forming their tastes and, and who they are as readers much earlier on um, than we give them that we get the benefit. I was going to say, I think it jumps back and forth from children to adult, adult to children. I mean, for example, an adult trend was the Vinci Code is huge, and, you know, and then a lot of people were looking for, like, the children's or YA, the Vinci Code, and I think, you know, Harry Potter was big, and then books like The Magician came, came out of the that grossness. So, I think it goes yeah. back and forth when it's hot. Yeah. That's exactly what I was just going to say. It sometimes trickles up with, I think, Harry Potter and the idea that fantasy wasn't wasn't just for those kids in the back of the room who draw during the entire class and they read their fantasy novels. Then everyone was reading fantasy, and then it opened it up to kids going beyond a traditional linear novel into different types of worlds and, and not thinking that that was an other type of thing to read. So with um, Cassandra Clare and uh, Clockwork Heart, are we starting to see the, and well, especially Scott Westerfeld's uh, Leviathan, are we starting to see the YA steampunk trends? Definitely. Okay. That means we're prepared for the new weird next. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> I'd also just like to, just because my area being in education and diversity at, at the school that I work at, um, the Hewitt School, my question is always how are teachers utilizing these materials in, this, in their classroom and how are they um, using them in the curriculum? they are, and if not, and I don't know if anybody on the panel has heard about that, if they're using these types of genres. Maybe not, it's a question. Well, not to get first, my boyfriend is an educator, and he works at a K-8 school, and he's been, um, he has a book group um, with like 10 of his students, and he's using YA fiction, so he's doing Shipbreaker, sort of like Rockstar, um, to buy books, um, you know. So it's more it's more to for uh, to analyze the the literature and you know. So many different genres, um, but you know that's just kind of a little. But I'm sure it's being used by that as well. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> the information I have on that is more anecdotal on an author by author basis. But if they get that information first and foremost, um, have a couple of authors who um, we've created teacher guides for and. And teachers and librarians will reach out to the authors first to say, oh, I'm using your book in this way, or oh, I bought 30 copies for the classroom, this is great, you know, this is something to engage. But I feel like it's more outside reading, this is the books that, that I find work on. Um, I don't necessarily feel like teachers are using them in the classroom, except this, that this is an outside reading option for you, and any particular um, topics may be complementary to what they're doing in the classroom. But I, I don't get the sense that they're, they're ordering 30 copies because they're all reading together and discussing as they would. Actually, that's that we can jump around a little bit and um, jump down to the technology question from earlier. With QR codes and mobile devices and
continual internet access. How is that shaping the reading experience? I know Scholastic played a little bit with it in the Skeleton Creek series with you know embedded video codes and things like that. How do you see that getting incorporated into books in the future, and especially as it relates to education? QR codes are very interesting, and I am not sure everybody is aware of exactly what that is, but it's, they're quick responses. They're uh, images that look, I would say, like a hologram image, and um, basically they allow for immediate content to be translated into your iPhone. So you can take a picture of the image, and whatever it is you're reading or advertising will come straight to your iPhone. Um, resources in addition to that. And I read a little bit about how uh, QRs are being used in Brazil, in a small town where they have um, these QRs on, on bullet billboards. And what, the, uh, what they've done is the students have different types of, of images, and they're trying to piece together whatever the story is in these one sentence. And so it's become this mystery hunt to try to find where they will find the next hologram. I'm just calling it for lack of a better term, but it's basically called QRs, quick responses. So it's in its beta form right now, but the possibilities are endless, how you can use it in schools, how you can use it in marketing. Um, I actually put a blog post up today just to play with the generator. There's a QR generator, and what it did was it just was able to give me an image of my blog in the form of this hologram, and once you once you leave here and you Google, uh, do a Google search for a QR, you'll see some of what the images look like. And if that's more of a, a printing end of it, obviously. Right, but the possibilities, I mean, we can look ahead to how websites and how social networking and how emails have taken us to new, new heights, really, when it comes to, to reading and the types of reading and how we assess that. I dare say every publisher in New York, if not in America, is investigating every avenue in this direction, madly, wildly, scrambling what will work, what won't work, what did, what did, what, what, what's going to be exciting and new, and that will get kids really excited and talk about the book to someone else. Um, we There's, um, Tony Ditch really sees Wandla has a lot of, of the, the QRs in it where you can, you can go up to your computer and hold up a certain page and download all sorts of information about the book, mostly pictorial. So art that didn't make it into the book or what the world really looks like that he's created but in 3D. Um, and that's been really fun to work with, but I feel that everything is, uh, we're in a big, huge experiment. We're all in a Petri dish of what we can do with our books and with um, other media to make the experience great for the kids, but also not lose the sense of story. Right, I think it's important still for the book to stand alone and read as a, a story without all of these extras, but you know, I think a lot of readers and I think kids especially like to kind of you know, dig deeper. And so I think you know, we're, we're developing some apps of some of our YA fiction, um, Beautiful Creatures and Beautiful Darkness of Two that we're starting with. You know, and I don't know exactly what's going to be in the app, but you know, it might be like this page. They talks about this, this, the history of this town, and you know, you can like click on a link and it takes you to that town or geography or maps, things like that, recipes. Um, but I, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see. I, I think more and more kids have iPhones, but I think my one worry, especially when it comes to education, is you know, if, there, if the gap, the socioeconomic gap, is going to increase with Technology, you know, I think poor schools don't have access to the same technology as, as wealthier schools, so that's just something to, to watch out for. Um, I was saying that you know, Penguin is, is experimenting with what can be done with this technology in the case that he's facing. I think, I think that some books more naturally lend themselves to apps um, more, more so than others. Um, I, I would just Say, I mean, I have the same kind of worry. And I'm also, I've also been very technology averse. I'm sort of the, the bane of my technology versus existence. Um, 